Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the City Lifestyle Commi uh, Committee meeting on the 10th of June 2020. I'm um, pleased to open the meeting at 10.40 a.m. and I'd like to welcome our members of the gallery. It's good to have you back with us. We've missed you while you've been away. And I'd also like to advise meeting attendees that this meeting is being audio recorded. I'd like to begin today's meeting by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and by paying my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Councillors, do we have any uh, apologies uh, for absences to declare? I note we're down one councillor at the moment, but um, I haven't received any advice on, from that councillor at this stage. Facilities. I'm sure that she'll be back with us soon. So there being no um, official absences to declare, we might just get right underway. Uh, councillors, I now refer to item 4.1, City of Logan Biosecurity Surveillance Program 2020-2021. Can the City Standards and Animal Care Manager, Mr Shane Mansfield, please make his way to uh, open discussions? And I see that Shane's already here. But before we open the discussions on this item, do any councillors have a conflict of interest that they'd like to share? There being no conflicts, I now invite Shane to deliver his report. Thank you, councillors. Uh, the purpose of the report is for Council to approve the 2021 Biosecurity Surveillance Program. Um, the program aligns to our 2017-2022 Biosecurity Plan. Under the Biosecurity Act, local government is required to ensure that prohibited matters, invasive matters and restricted invasive matters are managed within its local government area. <clears throat> An important part of this is a Biosecurity Surveillance Program. Why do we do this? Um, landowners have a general biosecurity obligation to ensure all reasonable steps are taken to prevent and minimise the risks from prohibited and restrictive invasive matters. Primarily, that relates to pest plants and pest animals as deemed under our biosecurity plan, again, 2017-2022. The, the program primarily uh, to a large extent is, a, is an open and transparent form of governance in terms of alerting the community to our um, inspection program. But also um, with respect to private premises in particular, it allows uh, entry to premises without consent. But in saying that, always our primary modus operandi is to seek consent of premises. Some of the premises, particularly with respect to pest plants and pest animals are the larger rural rural residential areas across the city and sometimes there is no habitation on the premises and sometimes the, the, the premises are quite large and they do absorb closely to each other. So in terms of the biosecurity surveillance program and the ability of consent, um, that works perfectly well for local government to operate its obligations. Similarly, we inspect Crown uh, reserves, waterways, etc., etc. Um, there's a couple of requirements um, as part of this. We obviously advertise and notify relevant uh, state and federal uh, government entities of the program, how it may affect them. And also, um, it's important to note that the um, funding for this is a part of our recurrent budget. It's an ongoing uh, recurrent operation of Logan City Council, again, to fulfil its purposes under the Biosecurity Act 2014. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Shane. I've got a question um, from Councillor Lane. Thanks very much for that. Um, just in terms of uh, notifying local residents that you're coming to uh, inspect properties, if they are adjacent to state or local government land, which the lantana or, or weed has come from, um, do you immediately address the local land issue in terms of council's property or the state property first? Uh, it, it most likely be a simultaneous operation because sometimes when we attend those larger properties, you, you obviously view over the property line and that's the advantage of the biosecurity program, yes. And the second part of that question is for people, uh, I noticed that we've got a lot of um, small farms um, where obviously a lot of weeds would um, you know, start to grow. Um, do we have uh, translation opportunities for those people who you know, speak languages other than English? so that they understand what the process is, how they've got to go about it and not just end up with a bill? 
So like it, it's it's not a process of just uh, Logan City Council turning up with a build. Uh, we, we build a relationship, no. and um, you know, as I said, our primary modus operandi is is to engage with any any owner on the premises as part of that process. We would use our translator services um, if there is any particular need for any particular language to be translated. Uh, we, we could certainly invest into that also. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Councillor Stemp. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I guess I just want to go slightly off on a tangent here, but um, during my campaign more recently, I received quite a few emails from residents concerned about the types of herbicides and in particular chemical components um, being used across our community and the impacts upon health and you know local flora and fauna. Um, last year, there was a resident in my division who had some concerns published in relation to the treatment of a plant called Sylvinia molesta on his property, um, which I believe was identified under this program. He noted that the effects he believed the treatment of this pest plant had on his on local wildlife on the property. Um, I understand that herbicides used by council are approved under the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority and are administered according to instructions, but I also know that I've been walking through our local forest when they're spraying and it's, it's quite unbearable in terms of the smell, et cetera. And I, I guess the bottom line is, I know that council are employing green alternatives, such as organic acids, et cetera, and I understand these are quite expensive and in some cases not always effective, so therefore limited. Um, and also I understand that council are using seasonal techniques and methodology to try to reduce the need for herbicides, which is great. But my point is that I um, understand that this program is essential, along with the treatment of pest plants in other areas right across our city. Sorry. <laughs> but um, the bottom line is that the community are concerned and I just want to get some clarity that council are taking steps to limit the use of herbicides wherever possible, that they're taking steps to phase out the use of herbicides with ingredients which have been identified as possibly being linked to health issues and that the council are taking steps to identify safer alternatives and the increase of green alternatives wherever possible moving forward. So thank you, Councillor Stemp. I welcome your thoughts, Shane. Thank you. Um, you, you correctly um, said that the Australian Pesticides Veterinary Medicines Authority is the industry regulator for Australia as a whole. Uh, they're the scientific experts. They're the people who register all herbicides in the country uh, effectively to ensure that they can be used safely and there's no impacts, and sorry, the, the labelling, the directions in terms of use um, do not affect uh, people, and also, more importantly, uh, are safe uh, in terms of the use of the environment if you follow the, the instructions, et cetera, et cetera. All of our people, both in parks and city standards, animal care, uh, are licensed um, by the Agriculture Chemical Distribution uh, Council, and um, effectively, they're, they're trained in, and best practice in terms of the use of the, of the herbicides. And in saying, and whilst we're talking predominantly about the use of herbicides, we do have alternative treatments. Um, we use saturated steam on roadways, uh, particularly on the sides of roads and particularly with hard surfaces. Um, that is used particularly in the terms, uh, the control of general weeds, et cetera, et cetera. We do use biological controls. Um, uh, Sylvania weevil, for, for example, and sometimes we use mechanical controls as well. We may deploy, depending on, a lot of it to, is to do with the site conditions and, um, and all of the weather elements, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, we do use uh, mechanical uh, devices as well, sometimes particularly on waterways, to, to take the layer of potentially um, weeds off and if that suits that particular situation. So we do our best to use a lot of alternatives. As you said, there are a lot of green alternatives out there. In terms of the success of that, we find the success of that to be less um, uh, conducive for the effect of control. Um, as I said, um, the, the Australian Pesticides Veterinary Medicines Authority are the experts. Um, we're licensed to use the herbicides and we license to use them effectively. If one of our key approaches is to cease spraying, uh, particularly if we're along the side of the road using herbicide or in a, um, a, a natural parkland area, um, we would obviously stop using that until the people would move away. Um, so in terms of the odour, 
that you've experienced in those reports of that. I'd probably be really interested in to having further dialogue with you in terms of how that happened and what the location was and to see if there's any improvements to our processes that we may uh, need to do in the future. If I can just speak to that through the chair. So I guess it's a matter of maybe getting it out to the community because I, I do mm. get a lot of concerns and they read a lot of things on social media. They, they read mm. a lot of things and, and I guess I've, I've had quite a few emails of late and there's just a, a general concern out there as, as to what is being used, why we can't be doing, you know, obviously they've seen people doing the spraying with the, the um, hot, sorry, the hot water, boiling water, which, is, which I think is great, but obviously it's very cost, costly. Um, I guess it's just maybe just educa educating the community a little bit more about what's happening in that, in that space, please. Absolutely. I, I agree 100%. And uh, straight after the meeting, I'll, I'll speak to the team and our um, important marketing and media team members and, and work out a communication plan for the community if that is uh, something that needs to be clarified for our community, certainly, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Stern. Mr Mayor, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Shane? How many offices do we currently have for the WEED program? We have two. Two? Two pest management inspectors, and we have um, approximately 10 pest plant officers who do the actual spraying. Uh, oh, yeah. The, we have specialist weed identifiers yep. Um, yep. Who, who, who do a lot of the surveillance. Are you winning the battle? And we have battle? one pest plant, sorry, one pest animal officer. Yeah, are you winning the battle? Um, I'm confident to say yes. Yes, we have a very effective ongoing program. And uh, yep. Yes. Because yep. I know that we had one officer. I know a little bit about this program. <laughs> they used to yeah. work there. We used to have one officer uh, who um, dealt with the old Logan. And, of course, the new Logan is four times the size. Mm. And we've only got the two officers. That's why I asked that question, because um, obviously... There's a lot more rural land now, and I know weeds like fireweed and that get around pretty quickly, and I'm just wondering whether we're winning the battle. I'm confident, yes. Um, certain weeds are seasonal as well, as you'd yep. probably appreciate. Um, we have no need to increase our resources for that team okay. at this point and in time. Can I just say one thing? Yes. The good thing about your program is that when there is uh, spraying needed, it's quite affordable. Um, I've actually used your services and paid the going rate. Mm. Um, and I found the spraying was excellent and the affordable, it, would, it was a lot, put it this way, it was actually cheaper for me to get you guys in than to do it myself. Um, and obviously with the equipment they had, uh, they were able to get through large treatment areas very quickly. Um, I think that's a good thing that the program is because I know people generally complain about the cost but it seemed to be quite reasonable to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually had similar questions and concerns that other councillors have raised. Um, certainly during my campaign, I had a number of people also talking about um, council using more natural, organic sort of herbicides rather than what they're using. Um, people are concerned of their own health and well-being when um, council's out there spraying. So I do want that to be taken on board that there is a huge concern out there. Um, the other thing, um, Singapore daisy is a huge um, concern, particularly in waterways. And my query, um, very similar to the mayor, um, was talking about the council actually goes out onto pro can go out to private property. Do you still offer that service, and how much is that service where you can actually um, eradicate those type of weeds that um, like so Singapore what, daisy? Yeah, so Singapore daisy is a restricted plant matter, mm -hmm. and uh, if that's detected under our surveillance program uh, on private premises, we would actively educate and work with the property owner for them to take the management of that. Yeah, um, I know council has previously, as yeah. the mayor said, yeah, that. Uh, uh, council officers can actually, you, you can actually pay for a service where yes. council can yes. actually yeah. Yeah, eradicate we, 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 it. Yeah, to so, be clear, we, we so offer the service. So do you still offer that, offer yeah. that service? Yeah. And we, how much is it? 
Uh, sorry, I'd have to take it on notice. I, I just don't know the exact fee off the top of my head. Okay. But I can find that out and, and communicate that back. The other concern is um, when it's coming from council land to private property, how do you deal with that? Well, obviously, we need to control it on our property as well. Um, <coughs> You know, that's, that's, the, that's the surveillance program. Uh, nothing is excluded. It, it includes all you know, federal, state, uh, council property, reserves, uh, waterways, et cetera, et cetera. I'll just, clarify, I'll just clarify that, if I may. Yes. If it comes from council land to private property, do you then eradicate from um, private property as well? Well, we would work with the private property owner. Um, and again, the, the, the same standard applies. Uh, communicate, work with them, uh, provide them the advice. Uh, the majority of landowners do voluntarily either take action themselves or, or voluntarily take our services. Uh, there's only a small per percentage of property owners where we'd have to escalate any uh, orders for, for control under the Biosecurity Act. So does that answer your question? No, it didn't really answer my question. I really wanted to know if it yes. goes from council land to private property, does council actually remove from the private property? Um, if it is encroaching from council land onto the private property, uh, we would have to speak to the, to the property owner because obviously uh, in terms of the program, that, that's, our, that's our approach first. Now. Um, in terms of an exact example, if it has 100% encroached from our property, um, our, I, I would have to really check. I'm not aware of any situation where that has actually happened. I, I'd take that on notice. Because sometimes it's incredibly hard to determine the starting point of, of some of these uh, pest plant species. Yeah, I get so that. to automatically assume that the, the council land is the starting point. Yeah, I, I, I understand yeah. that, um, but if you've got residents saying that mm. that is how it has transpired, um, you know, how, how it's evolved and mm. they don't like that particular weed on their property and have tried their hardest to get rid of it, mm. um, and, you know, I've got one in the council system at the moment, so that's why I'm asking that question. Yeah. The council does well, remove... Well, I'd be... I'd be really, uh, I'd write, like to look at that closely um, because obviously we, we need to get it under, under control on our property mm. uh, and that's, that's a primary um, act that we have 100% control over. Um, on the private premises, um, if it can be determined uh, that it's 100% derived from our own land, uh, that's, that's a question to take action on and, and to confirm. Um, as I said, sometimes it's incredibly hard to determine the starting point of some of these pest plants. Any further questions, Councillor Bradley? No. No. Councillor Wilcox. Um, I'd, I'd just love to look at the example. Sorry, just through the chair. Just following on from Councillor Bradley, um, I have a lot of rural in my division. Um, same thing. I have a lot of people that back onto reserves, they back onto council land, they have a lot of lantana running through their yards. Um, I find it odd that council don't clean up all of the lantana, yet the residents can get letters ordering them to, to clean up their yards, um, yet council still don't come along and remove all the lantana from the back of their properties and stuff like that. Uh, council does uh, have a program to remove uh, lantana off its property and it has specifically enhanced the resources for that approximately two years ago. So that's why I'm quite comfortable that we have the resources to attend to that. If there's a specific location, please let me know um, and we could look at that further. Council. If I may, I understand that um, Council's divisional funding has changed somewhat since we were last here, but there used to be actually a funding program that um, I know I certainly tapped into to enable us to use some of our desert budgets to help us work on in those more rural areas on limiting um, the growth of lantana. Is that program still exist, Shane? Um, we, we operate through our recurrent budget. As I said, approximately two years ago, Council um, resourced us to, to uh, take that approach and uh, we're comfortable, if you tell us the location, we can attend to that. Okay, um, 
So Sable Reserve off Lindale Road at Green Bank. Um, I know that that one has been cleaned up by the local bush care group. Um, because council didn't want to go through, I believe, and go and clean it up. So the bush care group has done an awesome job and they have cleaned that one up. Um, and the other one is um, I do have one area that has a waterway, Oxley Creek, but there's so much lantana next to it, and I have put this through already, there's so much lantana next to it that it actually affects the flow of the water coming down off the mountain um, and then floods all the residents' backyards. Um, just want the lantana cleared up. Clear yes. up. I've, I've taken notes on that and I'll, I'll communicate with you further. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. If you Thank wouldn't you. mind following up with Councillor Wilcox, that would be great. Councillor Hawke. Certainly. Hawk. Yeah, look, one of my policy sets was to um, get rid of the lantana, which is pretty much strangling most of Bar's scrub at the moment. Um, there's a lot of residents very concerned, very upset. You see it on the roadside, and I've actually done videos during my campaign showing all this lantana that's um, just taking over. The part of the issue that I had was um, when council would go in to address it, they would cut the lantana up to the owner's property, um, which isn't a good idea because lantana is a very interesting type of plant. It's one of those plants where if there's any part of it left remaining, it potentially uh, becomes a whole new plant. So it's probably not a good idea to cut these types of plants back. You kind of need to, and, and I, I understand you're concerned with poisons and whatnot, the only way to get rid of them is to poison them right down to the root and get rid of it completely. Um, so I, I think this is something that council probably has to take on, you know, in, in terms of a, a whole kind of area effect rather than just taking care of our bits of land, our, our little bits of property that we own and only and only poisoning the ones that we have. I think we have to actually work with the owners a bit like what we do with fire ants in terms of getting rid of that problem because lantern is not mm. something that you take lightly. It is a, a very, very dangerous plant. This type of plant can drop a horse, you know, can, can e easily kill a living thing if it's ingested. It's not a good plant, and, and it spreads very quick. I mean, birds love to pick up the little flowers that are on it, and they, they pick up a part of the plant, and they drop it off somewhere else, and all of a sudden, you've got a lantana outbreak over there. I think what council needs to do is get on top of lantana right now and get rid of it completely. That's my opinion on the matter. Thanks, Tony. Uh, would you be able to comment on that, Shane? Uh, certainly, I'm taking on board all of the comments from elected members and, and the particular locations. Um, I'll go back to the team and uh, confirm our, uh, our, our immediate program and, and communicate that back in terms of Lantana. And um, more importantly, if there's avenues for communication to the community, for them to uh, assist in their own management, certainly we'll look into that also. Thank you. Perhaps we should put something out to, to owners um, to uh, let them know that if they have a Lantana plan or they have something that they believe might be Lantana to contact council so we can kind of assist them in terms of getting rid of it. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Councillor Raven. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Shane, I'm going to pivot from, from plant-based pests to, to animal-based pests. <laughs> the, um, does the biosecurity surveillance program include fire ants? No, the Biosecurity Queensland has an eradication program for fire ants. And so, but do we, when we observe them or we observe what might sus we suspect may be fire ants, do we report that to them proactively? We, we report. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of communications internally, organisationally, for all relevant departments to report sites to Biosecurity Queensland. Thank you. No further questions, Councillor Raven? Councillor Bannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. With um, accessing private properties, as Councillor Wilcox said, we're majority rural at our neck of the woods. Do we give the owners much notice when we enter the properties? We're not just sort of turning up and flexing muscle and walking on the people's properties. Like, we're very private people out there when we own a bit of land. So I'm just hoping that the council, and I guess you would, would just give plenty of notice and plenty of tender touches when you're walking on someone's property. Th thank you, Councillor Bennett. Um, as, as I've said, our approach is 100% to obtain consent, uh, to establish a relationship, and when you establish a relationship, education becomes a lot more uh, seamless. 
and assisting for the community. And that's, that's our approach. Um, as explained, some of the properties are quite large and some of them are actually unoccupied. The surveillance program actually provides us the consent to enter uh, in the program. If somebody isn't there, we, we do notify that we have been there, but the primary high percentage of occasions are we establish a communication, a, 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 a natural consent and, and uh, a relationship to, uh, for the future, effectively. Sensational. Are there any further questions, councillors? Thank you, Shane. There being no further count, uh, questions, can I ask for councillor to councillors to consider the motion and do I have a mover for the motion? Councillor Bannon has moved the motion. Do I have someone to second the motion? Councillor Russell has seconded the motion. Could I please have a raise your hand if you're in support of the motion? That has been supported unanimously. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, councillors. Thank you. Um, now, uh, where are we? Uh, it does mark the end of the City Standards and Animal Care Manager's report. Is there any general business for yes. the manager? Councillor Bradley. Thank you. I've been um, dying to ask Shane this. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, a lot of residents uh, have spoken to me about the local law in relation to election signs. Uh, I personally would like to see it changed. Um, and signs on trailers, I know Shane and I drove around uh, various areas when I was previously a councillor and had a look at some very dangerous situations with advertising signs on trailers mm -hmm. and vehicles. Um, I, I suppose I am um, asking for a review of the local law I'm not sure if that requires um, some sort of workshop or something, but um, I'll, I'll just seek your guidance on that. Uh, with respect to election signs, <clears throat> I would recommend uh, initially a, a councillor workshop. Um, election signs are a, a subject where council cannot prohibit, we can regulate. Yes. And the, the regulation in our local law is, <clears throat> from our perspective, quite leading and in terms of alignment to the Local Government Act because obviously you don't want a local law that can be challenged in court. Yes. Um, if there are opportunities for improvement, we'd need to focus on the regulation side as part of that and, and certainly happy to uh, workshop that with elected members. Uh, in terms of signs on trailers, whether they're advertisements or election signs on trailers, um, the, the first port of call, is it legally parked and is it a registered vehicle? And sometimes you don't even need to worry about any signs or election signs local law for that because you have the power of parking enforcement to control those activities as well. I um, respect that, but however, I have had members yes. of the pub public wanting me to, to um, bring forward that they would, they would like council to change the local law in relation to that. Yes, certainly, and, and I, I, I recommend that first step and, and that process to go forward from there, whether you want to resolve that or whether you want to log that in for a future councillor workshop. I'm, I'm so do I need a council um, GB item to go up, ask? I think we can just coordinate a workshop, Thank maybe you. even one of our lunch okay. workshops might be a time when we could coordinate something like that. Maybe a briefing session. I know that councillors' diaries are fairly tight, but um, perhaps if um, Shane could uh, work, with, with, work with me to find a time, Certainly. we'll try and Council. coordinate something for councillors. Councillor Hall, did you have a question? <coughs> no, I'm OK, thanks. Okay. Are there any other for questions for the manager? No further questions. Thank you for your time, Shane. Much appreciated. Thank you, councillors. Councillors, I now refer to item 5.1, the draft community engagement strategy for 2020-2022. Can the customer experience and community engagement program leader, Tamara Weaver, uh, please make her way up for discussions? And before we open the discussion on this item, do any councillors have a conflict of interest that they wish to declare? There being no conflicts of interest, I now refer to the Customer Experience and Community Engagement Program Leader to open uh, for discussion. Tamara, you may proceed. Thank you, through the Chair. This is an exciting time for us in community engagement. We have put this strategy forward um, 
we realise that it's time for broader community engagement. Uh, and that starts with um, going out to the community and helping them design with us a strategy. You'll note uh, in the backing papers, the strategy, uh, we have laid the foundations to have the conversation with community. It's really important that this document is for community and they can take ownership over it as well. Part of that's also around how we at Council here undertake community engagement. So we want to look at different ways to do it. We also want to empower our staff to be able to build engagement seamlessly into their business as well. Uh, we are excited that this is an opportunity to connect with our community, uh, to listen to our community authentically as well. And I think there'll be a great partnership moving forward. Thank you, Tamara. I'll now open the floor to discussion. Councillor Raven. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a few questions. Tamara, will this be used in the co-design process for the economic development strategy and vision and tie them in together? Through the chair. So that's a, uh, the co-design there is different to this. Uh, it does link. I think they use the word visioning at times, which is separate to there might be a little bit of confusion around community visioning and what that is. And I'd be happy at a later date if um, uh, councils would like to workshop through what that looks like. Uh, we are heavily involved in that. They are consulting with us on that as well to make sure that the best outcome for the community, um, even though they've got a consultant doing that work. Cool. Thank you. And are we looking at, when we're looking at other strategies that have worked for other councils, are we just looking in Queensland or are we looking the whole way across the country? Around Australia. So we engaged a consultant to do this body of work with us to look at best practice because we don't want to focus just on Queensland, we want to focus on Australia, but I think the point that we need to make is we are unique here in Logan. We want to make a strategy that works for us here in Logan and in the Logan context to us and our people, um, but it's nice to have a look around as well and take ideas uh, of others around Australia and internationally as well. Thank you. And so when we were on the IMC, I provided feedback to the administrator that the issue that I identified with the engagement strategy was that elected members were excluded from it. Um, I don't see a great deal of us being included in this because the key engagement body for the organisation with the community should be the elected members because we, uh, we knock thousands of doors during an election, we knock thousands of doors every year afterwards and there's concern, as you can see from the nodding of my colleagues' heads, that the, the organisation is trying to circumvent the councillors' relationship with their community when we are the ones who should have the closest relationship and which is, I'm concerned that the engagement strategy seeks to create a second channel in that the organisation and the staff have a closer relationship to our constituents than we do, which I don't think is appropriate or acceptable. So I'd love to see how this is actually going to be channeled through us um, so that we can stand with the organisation instead of looking over and going, hey, how come you guys are talking to my community and I'm not? Yeah, and I think it's a real partnership between elected members and council staff as well. We need to be working together in this process I think part of it is also having understanding the role um, that elected members can play, like you, you, you talked about. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Um, defining that as well as defining what key stakeholders are. And this is part of this process. And so moving forward, there's a huge engagement piece with yourselves and us to sit down together and workshop through what that looks like and how it will work for you and work for the community and work for us as well. Awesome. I look forward to that because it's, um, it almost has to be more than a partnership. We should actually be your conduit to the community because we spend more time in the community than staff do. We, um, we engage in different ways and on a whole host of issues that makes us a silo breaking element. And also um, we've, we're very personally motivated by being close to our community because obviously if we're not, they don't vote for us again. So um, with no disrespect to the staff or the good work that the organisation does, um, there's actually more councillors than there are community engagement officers as well. So you can really harness us as essentially extensions of, of, your, um, of your branch or your team, I should say, that you can focus your work through and then we can get you information faster and quicker and, and we can get that real engagement that the community is dying for. Because I think they are eager to see better community engagement. I just think they'd like to see it through their councillors rather than through, through the staff. And through the chair, that's a great question for community as well, to ask community how they'd like to be engaged and how, what works for them as well, because that's, that's a big part of this too, to make sure it's, because ultimately it's about the community, so we need to make sure it works for them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Raven. Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, when I was on the IMC as well, I was waiting to, for this uh, opportunity. Unfortunately, I left before um, it came up, so I didn't have my two cents worth. But I'm very, very passionate about um, community engagement. 
always have been engaged the community about any little project, big project, um, to get them on board. Does this um, also include how we communicate to the community? Because I certainly experienced during the election campaign particularly, dare I say, um, and no offence to anyone in the room here, and no, no offence intended, but the communication style just didn't get out there properly to the community. So I certainly would like to see how we communicate better. Can Through the chair. So there's opportunity here to, so the framework was attached as well, which is again to assist staff. So what I'm talking about in terms of empowering staff on how we can engage better. We've got 25 branches across council. Uh, engagement, our, our team is there to advise on best practice, um, to liaise with council branches. We're not also across all of the communication that would be going out. There's a media component, a marketing component, but there's an opportunity for us to collaborate better in that space. I really seriously think that needs to be done because, um, and it's not, I'm not referring to your brand, your area or the media area or the marketing area, I'm referring to other areas in council. Um, you know, like I said, I, I copied and pasted some communication and on my social media and, and that did not go down very well, purely because it wasn't articulated well. I didn't even understand it, so, and I, you know, I, I was on the outside, so I, I had no idea um, what was any different. So I think it just needs to be better. Thank you. Through the chair. Engagement is also something that, uh, again, which we've referenced where we're, we train staff. Engagement is not just about communication. There's a lot of strategy that goes behind all community engagement pieces of work. And so to, it would be a nice opportunity to sit down with all of you as well uh, for some of you who might have questions around how we go about that, which could answer um, some of the communication questions. Thank you, Councillor Bradley. Did you have something to say, Kathy? Um, through the chair, Councillor Bradley. <coughs> What I think you're talking about is tone of voice. And from, from my perspective, there's a huge opportunity for us as a council to evolve our tone of voice, the language, how we actually communicate to, to um, our constituents, to our residents. Um, one of the examples that Tamara's been heavily involved in is the tone of voice we've used on our website. So we've broken it down into, into plain English so that it can be easily translated to people from, from multiple, um, from, from different language backgrounds. Um, and it is really straightforward. That that plan is to evolve that across other communications. I, I will acknowledge that, that that is a big piece of work to get that consistent across the entire council, yet we're very passionate about embarking on that journey and I foreshadow the next report that Rebecca Smith will be talking um, about some of the work in, in that marketing strategy. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Councillor Stent. Thank you. Um, through the chair, I guess, um, a big focus of this appeared to be obviously digital and the Have Your Say website. I just want to, want to get a bit more understanding of how that works and how many people actually engage through that. Because obviously with, with COVID-19, I understand it's harder to get out in the community. But I know also that people kind of want you to go to them to ask the questions, not ask them to come to you. And there's just concern that there's um, that's an understanding of how this, how effective this have your say item um, element is, please. Through the chair, even though we're talking about digital, particularly I'll address with COVID-19 first, um, we still will do face-to-face. -face. We will still engage with people where we can appropriately in forums. Uh, we, we, you know, that for us is, is essential. Um, the digital, we will have to rely on potentially a little bit heavy. We will have to be... Um, robust enough to potentially pivot if we have to, if we go back between levels of restrictions as well, we, ne we know that we'll have to address that. But there's, there's so many creative ways that we can get out there to do engagement by appointment, to do, you know, uh, all of that sort of stuff for our more vulnerable community that we will seek out. Um, and that's all part of the engagement planning. You know, engagement planning can be 45 pages worth of, of methods that we would use in that process, depending on the uh, project we're using. Uh, the Have Your Say engagement platform, uh, which is through Bang the Table, it's a platform that has approximately 3,000 registered users at the moment. Uh, it's growing in, in, in size. We've had it for three years or coming up on three years now. Uh, it's, it's a good platform for people who choose to go through digital. Uh, it has a lot of different functionalities on it. You can have forums, um, you can have 
surveys as your basis, but then you can have discussion boards. We used it fairly heavily in our animal local law consultation for that opportunity to be very transparent for people to see the answers come up as they were coming through. So it has a lot, a lot of different functions to it that we can use. Okay, thank you. Councillor Power. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, when I saw this come through with the new legislation in regards to the corporate plan, I, I thought, geez, we better get this right. Um, my concern with, with consultation is listening to the empty vessels out there and the people that have got a gripe. I hope we use a involuntary way of getting consultation rather than a voluntary, because what I find is that if it's a voluntary situation, you get a wrong picture of what people really want. In other words, those people who've got vested interests or um, have a gripe will always go out of the way to participate where the, where the average punter out there, and this is the good thing about councillors, is that when they door knock, it's an involuntary system. In other words, they go to every house, they speak to every resident, and they talk to them and they get a conclusive outcome from a, a synopsis of the whole electorate. Mm -hmm. When we do a survey, we might get 1% return. In the past, we've done a 1% return. And generally, they're the people that have got gripes. And generally, those people who... And if you did a town planning consultation, I would imagine that the only people that would participate are those who want subdivision rights and want to make money out of it. The, the average punter out there, they're not that interested because they're happy. Um, I'm very interested in how you're going to carry this out and get a real picture of what the average punter out there wants. Um, because if you listen to the 20% to the of the people out there, you'll lose the 80%. The people out there in the community don't agree with each other and we've got to be careful that we get the right mix so that we on top of it, but personally, I think the system wasn't broken. Um, I thought that the councillors do a good job, and, and if, they don't, if they don't door knock, they don't get elected. If they don't talk to their residents, they don't get elected. And the process is that probably at, right at this moment, these councillors are probably the closest to the community than they'll ever be for the four years because they've just gone out and door knocked their electorate, and they know what residents want because they've heard it from every every mouth out there, what they want. We, your consultation process, I doubt very much where you'll get to 1%, but I'll be very interested to see how it goes. Just a comment, thank you. Just a comment? Okay, um, Councillor Lane. Um, I just wanna say one of the things that I find most amazing is the enthusiasm and the, the enjoyment that whenever you guys present, you just radiate with this I've got this idea and I want to get it out there and 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 I want it to be a success and, and, and I want to make the community come on the journey with us. I think Councillor Raven and Mayor's uh, comments about bringing the councillors along is a really important step in that because um, for some of us we've watched policies come and go and when you talk about 3,000 hits on something, we had failed candidates that had more hits on their Facebook pages than that. So. I just think in terms of bringing us along on the journey or, or not talking to us, but, uh, you know, everyone's got an idea and an opinion and we've got the same enthusiasm and the same just gut-wrenching, you know, desire to actually perform for our community. So bring us on that journey with you and let us enjoy the process as well. I think that's really important, but good on you. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Councillor Raven. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Councillor Lane's exactly right. We have the same excitement about the process that you do, which is why you're hearing some griping that we're not included. I'll give you a great example. On page 32 of your agendas, councillors, which is page five of the background papers, which is the draft framework for community engagement, who is involved in community engagement? It has a nice little table for those playing at home and listening to the audio recording. Um, elected members get mentioned once, right at the top. It's only the mayor and his responsibility is to lead councillors in their understanding and compliance with this framework promotion. and active promotion of it in the community. Um, really, it should be to lead, like his role should be to lead councillors in their delivery of this, this program because 
Um, exactly what Mr. Mayor said, we are so close to the community at the moment. I, just off the top of my head, I know that Councillor, between us, Councillor Bradley, she knocked about 8,000, 9,000 doors during the election. Uh, the whole division one. Yeah, so 9,500 doors, that is. And I know she went back to some of them twice. I knocked about 5,000. I'm sure other councillors have similar numbers in here. Just with two councillors there, we're at nearly, we, we are, we're at 15,000, we're at 15,000 engagements. And that's leaving something behind, getting feedback, and then we come into the building with lists of lists of tasks that we're trying to achieve. Um, and we can harness that energy and we can give it to you, um, but we do want to, we don't just want to be partners, we don't just want to be stakeholders, we want to be the people that you deliver this framework through. We want to be the voice of council. When it talks here about um, staff having relation, council's relationship with the community should be councillors' relationship with the community supported by council. Not two, not two equal parties standing side by side. Leaders, which is what we're elected to be, focusing your knowledge, your experience, your technical expertise, your planning, which is all the good stuff that you've got in here that I really want to harness because I don't want to do that stuff. But I do want to talk to my community. So please put us front and centre so we can harness all of your energy, enthusiasm and wisdom, amplify it, and then the community will stop complaining that they never get engaged with or I didn't know about that development or nobody spoke to me about the local laws. Even though you've got great engagement on Have Your Say, Have Your Say is a self-selecting platform that has, it isn't always easy to manage for people who are looking for stuff, let alone for people who don't know it exists and don't know that you're putting up something that's really important to them. But if I door knock 3,000 houses and tell them all to put their information into there and give them a little card with the link, I guarantee you, you'll, you'll triple your, your engagement overnight. Or maybe not overnight, I can't door knock that quickly. Thank Hello. you, Councillor Raven, for your energy and enthusiasm and impassioned plea. Um, I would note that this is the draft community engagement strategy, so I'm sure that Tamara and her team are listening and taking away the valuable advice that's been provided by councils today. And basically what I'm hearing is that you want to be involved, more than involved, you actually want to be a driver um, in this process. So, Tamara, I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Through the chair, that's exciting for me uh, because I've got a captive audience here who really want to participate and, and that's what it is. It's, it's a draft and that's why we're bringing it now. That's why we waited for new council to come on board. It is really important that we all go on this journey together and it is, it, it is open for input. Um, that's what it's all about. So the, these documents are definitely not shut for business. Um, they're absolutely open and in fact it's evolving with yourselves but also with the community as well. So that's what we're excited about. Excellent. And I have every confidence with you leading this program, this will be a really good outcome for Council. And um, I know certainly part of my election campaign was to provide greater community engagement for the residents so that they know more of what's happening in their areas in a more timely fashion. So I look forward to seeing the um, next incantation of this particular report. Is it possible for... Council Hall, did you have a question? Yeah, I just had an overall statement. Um, I'm not a massive fan of it, simply because I like to know what's happening with my residents and I want them to feel that they can speak to me at all times about any matter that they have an issue with. I hate it when, you know, I, I hate it when to, I hear about conversations that have happened that I haven't been involved with and they have happened through the organisation and, and, you know, and it's kind of, if they don't get it right, it's kind of shunned upon me, you know. Something that the, the same way as what councillors do is um, dictates the perception of how Logan City Council is perceived. What Logan City Council does is how Logan Council is perceived. And, and this kind of just provides, for me, less opportunities to talk to my constituents because they will no longer come to me with an issue. They'll come to you. <laughs> and I don't think that's the right way to go about it because you need these conversations. You need to understand what your residents want in order to govern, in order to put things in place to benefit them. And I think by taking us out of some of these conversations, it's not happening. We're not hearing what's going on. So how can we make these decisions for them if we're not hearing what's going on, if it's just going through the plethora of the building? Now, I understand we've been told, you know, to um, let, let um, the, the building itself take a bit of control and, and do some of these little mini tasks for us and whatnot. But I still like to be a point of engagement for my community so that the community knows that I'm acting for them and when they have an issue, they can come to me and get it resolved. And look, I, I don't think there needs to be a policy in place to teach people how in this building how to be nice, <laughs> okay? The people in this building should be nice. Anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's common sense. You be nice to the people around you. You don't need a policy put in place to, to teach you 
how to have a smile on your face and how to be polite to someone, that's a given. That's a given for any Australian. Councillor Hall, if I may, my experience is that um, different parts of council do community engagement to different levels of service. And some areas in council do an outstanding job and some perhaps could do with some support in this space. And I believe this strategy is intended to be a holistic strategy right across council. And I acknowledge what councillors have said today that perhaps we need to be a little more engaged and on the journey. And certainly I would argue that I think that we're quite pivotal to the success or failure of this particular strategy. So it's certainly in council's best interest to get councillors involved. Um, I also recognise that in the past there was wavering degrees of support from councillors in terms of being engaged in community engagement. And what I'm hearing today is that you guys want to be engaged. And I think that Tamara has heard that loud and clear. I'm going to want to wind this up. I'm going to allow one more quick question, which is going to be Councillor Wilcox, or we're going to be here till midnight. Councillor Wilcox. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Through the chair, Tamara, I just want to say your, your enthusiasm is infectious on this. Um, you can see how proud you are and, and, and engaged in it and that sort of thing. But again, it just for me, this gives the residents another avenue to get in contact with council. I, I agree with Tony, uh, sorry, with Councillor Hall, that I think that yes, the community does like coming through us for certain things and that sort of thing, but I also like the fact that it will give the community a different avenue so that they can get in contact with the council. But I agree completely. Please take us on the journey. Include us as councillors because we have been out there with the community. Um, sometimes I think we have a better understanding of our communities because the officers don't live in our areas, so we know what's going on. We're, we're at the forefront of it. We're the face of the council we're always out there and that sort of thing so please include us on this journey so that we're on the ground and we know what's going on and that sort of thing thank you for the comment councillor wilcox councillors the uh, recommendations are on the screen ahead of you do i have a mover for the recommendation councillor raven has moved the recommendation do i have a seconder councillor stemp those in favor please raise your hand Okay, I note not all councillors are present at the moment, so we'll go through them. Councillor Power in support, Councillor Bradley's support, Councillor Russell's support, Councillor Raven's support, Councillor Fraser, Councillor Heremiah, Councillor Stemp, Councillor Wilcox, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Karansky, all in support. And Councillor Hall, are you abstaining or are you voting against? Voting against. Voting against. Thank you. That marks the end of the customer experience and community engagement report. Is there any general business for Tamara while she's here? Being no general business, thank you very much for your presentation, Tamara. And Tamara, do you have any GB for the councillors? No GB, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, councillors, we've actually got um, items 6.1 and 6.2 coming up, and I note both of those are confidential items, so I've had a chat with the minute clerk, and we can actually move into confidential to deal with both of those items at the same time to save moving our, our gallery in and out on multiple occasions. So I'll now refer to item 6.1. Can the Acting Marketing and Events Manager, Rebecca Smith, please enter the discussions? And before we open the discussions for item 6.1 and 6.2, may I ask if any councillors have any conflicts of interest that they wish to declare? There being no conflicts of, in uh, conflicts of interest, um, as I mentioned, I note that item 6.1 and 6.2 are confidential reports. Do councillors wish to um, move the meeting into a closed session to discuss the contents of the report? Uh, <laughs> Councillor Raven. No one else is going to do thank it. Thank you. Can I have a seconder to move council uh, into confidential? You won't be able to ask your questions if you have questions in a public forum. Councillor Murphy, could I have a show of hands for those who support council moving into confidential? I believe that's unanimously supported, albeit that we have two counts, uh, one councillor missing at the moment, Councillor Lane. Um, my apologies to the gallery. We'll just be closing for confidential for the moment.
Firstly, I'd just like to um, apologise to the public. I know that you were left lingering out there for quite some time and um, as this item was commercial and confidential, that's why we moved into confidential today. And uh, there, this is actually quite an exciting pair of reports and I look forward to a time when that information can be made public and that you can enjoy all of the report as, uh, the report as much as we have. Councillors, um, I note that there was a recommendation contained within the confidential report and the motion for 6.1 reads as follows, that the City of Logan strategic marketing framework as attached to the report of the marketing and events manager dated the 10th of June 2020, sorry, be endorsed. Two, that commencing from the 17th of June 2020, the marketing and events branch be authorised to deliver the initiatives outlined in the City of Logan strategic marketing framework as detailed in clause one above, using a phased approach with existing funding. And three, that at the discretion of the marketing and events manager, the corporate governance manager be requested to place the confidential report of the marketing and events manager dated 10 June 2020 and associated attachments into the public records. Councillors, do I have a mover for the yes. motion on front of you? Yes. Councillor Bradley, I note, has moved that report. Do I have a seconder? I, I, Mr Mayor has seconded the report. Can I please have a show of hands for those who are in support? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I believe that's carried. And just for the minute, Clerk, we have um, uh, the Mayor, Councillor Bradley, Councillor Russell, Councillor Raven, Councillor Fraser, Councillor Heremiah, Councillor Murphy and Councillor Kransky in favour. Could, and Councillor Lane, I didn't see her down the back there. Thank you, Councillor Lane. And Councillor Bannon, are you in favour? Councillor Bannon is also in favour. Um, could Councillor Wilcox, are you in favour? Could those of you who are opposed, please raise your hand. Do I have anyone who's abstaining? And Councillor Hall has abstained. Thank you, Councillors. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry, Councillor Stamp. You're hiding over there in the corner. I didn't see you. Awesome. With that being said, we'll now move to item 6.2. Um, and I'll ask if the Minute Clerk can actually pull that up on the screen in front of us. Um, I, I'll read the recommendations out. I note that there's a recommendation contained within the confidential report. The motion reads as follows, that option two, as detailed in the confidential report of the marketing and events manager dated 10 June 2020, be endorsed as a concept which can be further refined with minor tweaks after endorsement. That option two, as detailed in clause one above, replace the existing design through a rolling two-year program of works using existing funding, as detailed in the confidential report of the marketing and events manager dated 10th of June 2020. And that commencing from the 17th of June 2020, the phasing out of the existing designs specified in option three, as detailed in the confidential report of the marketing and events manager dated 10 June 2020, be endorsed and four, that at the direction of the marketing and events manager, the corporate governance manager be requested to place the confidential report of the marketing and events manager dated 10th of June 2020 and any associated background papers into the public records. Do I have a mover? Councillor Bradley has moved. Do I have a seconder? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor has seconded the motion. Can I have a show of hands, please? We have the Mayor, we have Councillor Bradley, Councillor Russell, Councillor Raven, Councillor Hall, Councillor Fraser, Councillor Heremiah, Councillor Lane at the rear, uh, Councillor Bannon, Councillor Wilcox, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Karansky, and Councillor Stemp, have you abstained? Councillor Stamp has abstained. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for your patience with that one. Now, we're just going to do a little shuffle. We're going to move to item 9.1, which I, I believe you were... Oh, I beg your pardon, just before we let Beck go, is there any GB for the manager? Got a little bit ahead of myself. Beck, have you got any GB for us? No, thank you. My apologies. Thank you for your report, Beck. Much appreciated. Councillors, um, we've got two port reports to go. Um, one of them was a late report, which you will have received. Um, it's item 9.1, and I'm actually going to move to item 9.1 ahead of item 7.1. Now, this is a confidential item, so I will ask councillors if you feel that we need to go into confidential to discuss this item, 
or whether we are in fact ready to make a decision on this item. Is there anyone who would like to go into confidential? Okay. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to move the recommendation awesome. in public. Awesome. Okay. Well, as we won't be moving into confidential, have you got the uh, report up in front of us? Here we go. Here's the motion. Councillor Bradley is prepared to move the motion. Can I have a seconder for the motion? Councillor Wilcox has seconded the motion. Can I have a show of hands for those who support the motion? I believe that is unanimous. Thanks, everyone. Councillors, I now draw your attention to item 7.1. Now, I would just like to make it known that there is a confidential element to this report. Um, I won't move us into confidential at this stage, but if you feel there is a need to uh, speak to a confidential item, please be mindful of what is confidential and raise your hand accordingly. Um, I'll now refer to item 6.1. Um, can the Sports, Leisure and Facilities Manager, Mr Nigel Brown, please come and join us? Thank you, Nigel. And I'll now ask the Sports, Leisure and Facilities Manager, Nigel, to um, discuss the Excuse report. Excuse me, Chair. Um, did you say 6.1 or do you mean 7.1? I beg your pardon, 7.1. We've already... I, I misspoke. Thank you. Um, my apologies, Nigel. Would you please speak to item 7.1? Thank you. Through the Chair. Um, so this report's been brought forward uh, following the GB item that was raised at the last Council meeting, which is in your report there, so brought forward by Councillor Bradley. Um, and I actually really um, appreciate the opportunity to talk to this report because um, the Underwood Park multi-sport project, I think, is a very exciting uh, achievement for the city. It's certainly the largest commitment of funding for a community infrastructure project that I've been involved in. Um, so it's been very exciting to be involved in the project in that space. And while it has been exciting and it provides some um, great outcomes from the for the community in respect to the, the value of new community infrastructure. There are always, with these types of projects, some challenges which have been identified and detailed in this report. So I don't want to go through the report in too much detail. I appreciate you've all had the opportunity to, to read that. But, um, but obviously there's been a few changes uh, from when the project was first conceived, um, particularly around the, the scope of the project and also with regards to some of the funding commitments. So this is a partnership between the Queensland State Government and Council with initially the State Government funding uh, or proposing to fund 100% of, of the project. Um, it is being delivered by Osco Modular um, and the strategy behind that was to enable the facility to be developed during the period of closure of sport from September through to March with the intent of being able to uh, do those works during the season close and have the facilities available to those sporting clubs uh, at the commencement of the season. Obviously, a few things have changed over that period of time with COVID-19, and uh, as much uh, as that has brought a lot of heartache and, 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 and uh, trouble to our community, it actually worked in favour for this project because there were some delays which have been uh, needed to be accommodated. Uh, you'll note that the project is in two separable portions, um, and uh, so separable portion one is effectively the single storey components of the, the project and that is due for practical completion on the 19th of June and the separable portion two is the double storey components of the facility and I'll just update the report at the time of writing it was uh, the PC date was set at the 14th of July it's now set at the 14th of August so there has been some shift in that project as well. Um, so if I can move to the additional project costs, uh, as I mentioned, initially the project uh, cost uh, budget was 9.11 million. Um, there was some project change in incorpor incorporating the BMX clubhouse and an increased area for the mountain bike storage, um, which increased the project budget to 10.3 million. And also at that time, council committed uh, 1.19 million into the project as well. So um, the process of developing a facility and delivering a facility of this nature obviously goes through a detailed design phase and also a stakeholder engagement process over and above the earlier engagement that took place. Through that process um, there was a number of uh, items that were added to the project um, including additional cold rooms, air conditioning, 
uh, redesign of the kitchen for the football club, um, and also the inclusion of instantaneous hot water, which triggered a, a need for an, a power upgrade for the park. Um, so those works resulted in uh, additional costs being borne to the project, um, but also there was the inevitable on these projects, the discovery of some asbestos on the site, which, um, which needed to be removed and, and mitigated, which added another $350,000 to the cost of the project. At the time of that occurring, the minister wrote to the interim administrator at the time and sought council, uh, council support in covering that cost independently of the project. And in the nature of the way we structure our budgets, um, when we do have dangerous and hazardous issues such as this within sporting facilities, we have a funding reserve which enables us to tap into that to address those issues quickly, which is what council elected to do at that time. So council in, uh, effectively added another $350,000 to, the, to their contribution. Um, in response to the design changes, there was uh, a, a further commitment from the state government of a further $880,000. Um, so that's now taking the total project cost to $11.875 billion. Um, I did just miss before the re reference to QBuild managing this project, and I'll talk to that in a little bit more detail in a separate section of, that, of this project. One of the issues that was raised in the GB item and, uh, is around asset replacement, and in particular pathways that were replaced as part of the project. Um, and, and rightly so, it was identified that the pathways had been reduced from what was two metre pathways uh, through the precinct down to a minimum acceptable width of 1,000 uh, millimetres or a metre. Um, now, that was undertaken and input before we actually, the principal being council, had an opportunity to review those, those drawings and the designs. And subsequently, we have given an instruction to the contractor to widen that to 1,800, uh, to a minimum of 1,800 um, millimetres. Uh, as per the Australian standard. Now, while the others did comply from a certifier's perspective, from a practical user perspective, they, they really wouldn't have effect been effective because of the, the narrowness of the paths. Now, that, they will, there will be some additional costs which will be absorbed by the project as a result of that, and we are still in discussions with OSCO uh, around negotiating those, the share of those costs based on the fact that we believe it didn't meet the specified brief and also that it was undertaken without the consultation and approval of the principal being Logan City Council. The, uh, the next section looks at the rectification of the nature play area. So the nature play area is a section of the park behind the, the netball courts and there's a, a steep bank coming down to the nature play area which was established um, um, I think 12, 18 months ago, maybe two years ago. Um, during the, the works, there was some heavy rain which did create some significant erosion uh, into that area, washed away softfall and created some damage to that, to that asset. Um, now, under the contract, the contractor obviously is required to rectify any damage that's caused as a result of uh, the works that are undertaken. And what, what has occurred since then is that they have rectified the stormwater management on the site so to reduce that uh, water runoff from the courts. So there's been some significant drainage improvements that have been undertaken as part of that. At this stage, the section of the nature play area still has some temporary fencing around it. That was on the basis that the area had um, some concrete pipes which were part of that nature play area, which provided an opportunity to, for uh, people to climb up onto the temporary sense around the construction site and potentially provide an opportunity to access. So the decision was made by the, the contractor at, in uh, consultation with council to temporarily fence off that section as well. Now those temporary fences, the rectification works will all be done as part of handover of that project and that will be done at the cost uh, of the contractor. Um, the final section of the report refers to project management. So when this project was first provided, the opportunity was provided to, to council, it was effectively ahead of our program. Now, my branch, the community, the Sport, Leisure and Facilities branch has the Community Infrastructure Program, which are our capital delivery team who deliver all of our sport and recreation and community infrastructure 
projects and other council buildings ac across the city. Um, to put this project into our program would have delayed the works and not achieved some of the outcomes as far as the timeliness of delivery. And at the time, the, the minister offered the services of QBuild, which is also within his uh, department, to as an option to deliver that project and meet those timeframes. Now, that is a uh, process of engaging QBuild. So, council engages QBuild as the project manager and on a fee-for-service, which is um, detailed in the in the confidential background papers. The um, so that was that was the decision to do that. Looking back at how that project has been delivered, QBuild are obviously a highly qualified project management services. They deliver significant infrastructure across the state. Um, our experience with this project was that we felt that council lost some of the control that we would normally have uh, and our ability to engage more directly with our community through this process because of the, the three parties that were involved, being the, the department, sport and recreation component of the department, QBuild and council. Um, with the projects delivered through my community infrastructure program, we have a far more closer relationship with our, our clients, being the community. Um, and also the benefit for delivering in-house is that council absorbs the cost as a recurrent expense for the, uh, rather than adding that to a, to a project cost and taking away some of the deliverables that could be achieved through the funding provided. Um, currently, the community infrastructure program is delivering the Cronulla Park PCYC uh, and also about to commence with the, the Kingston Motor Factory col Cultural Precinct. So quite comfortable and capable of, of delivering projects of this, of this qu quantity. Um, I'll quick just reference the previous council decisions in this report. I think it's important to look historically just to bring you up to speed in that process. So one of the reports I refer to is um, the decision of council at its meeting of the 8th of November. 2017, and that's where a site infrastructure plan was developed to guide the future development of the of the precinct, and that largely was used as to assist in leveraging that support from the state government in securing that significant funding up front. So that that was the the concept effectively that council endorsed at that time. Um, the remainder of the report talks about funding arrangements and how. Uh, disposal of the Narrow District Community Centre was utilised to, uh, to contribute the, towards the funding for Council's component of the process. Um, the reason for that is that Narrow District Community Centre, Underwood Park Community Hall were, are both to be disposed of, or certainly the hall is because it's already gone, and then the, com the resolution from Council is to, uh, to sell the Narrow Street Community Centre, and then the community space at the Underwood Park facility then becomes that general community space. Uh, for the for that sector. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Nigel. I really appreciate the thorough report that you put forward for councillors. Do we have any questions? Uh, I just wanted to make sure Councillor Bradley got the opportunity to go last. Is there anyone else? Councillor Bradley. Thank you, uh, and I really do appreciate um, that summary, Nigel. The report um, is quite detailed and. and Appreciate that as well. There was a component though that was missing that I asked to receive, and please tell me if that is not confident. That is confidential. No. no? Okay. Discuss that. So um, the concern that I had, and and I suppose you have confirmed it now um, with the email that you sent me, that the community space is actually a lot smaller than what the community were consulted about. So, um, in the email that I have received from um, Nigel, it actually says that there were 784 square metres that was consulted with the community. However, the community are going to get 533 square metres. Um, this is a bit disappointing in that, well, it's extremely disappointing in that Narrow District Community Centre will be gone, obviously sold, as you, as you stated. The hall has gone. That was a space that was used by the community. So the intent was to, um, initially, the intent long ago was to um, put a number of facilities into one. 
unbeknownst to us when we started this process so long ago, uh, the Club Rochdale went into um, voluntary administration and there was also community space in there as well. So effectively we had three community spaces in, in that section of Division 1 and now we've got a less uh, community space than what the community were told. And I understand and I appreciate that the sporting facilities are absolutely amazing, but the community as a whole um, are missing out on the community space. So when it comes time for a Springwood Community Centre to be discussed, which is another centre within Division 1, um, I just want that to be made sure that that is captured, that the community actually are missing out. Thank you. Nigel, did you want to comment on the community space there? Um, I, the only comment that I will add is that obviously that was part of the design, detailed design process to, con to reconfigure. There were a number of elements of the project that changed. There were a number of elements that were added to in particularly, as Councillor Bradley said, with the sporting clubs um, receiving much greater uh, outcomes than what was originally in that concept plan. The decision around the general community with space was based around the the guidelines as determined in the community infrastructure strategy, which indicates the, the demand or requirement in that sector for a 400 square metre community space. So noting that that decision involved the removal of Nerida Street and Underwood Park Hall, the community infrastructure strategy identifies the need for a general community space of 400 square metres, which, is, which was the basis and the rationale, I guess, behind that um, a willingness or preparedness to to reduce what was in the original scope and obviously also to enable us to min manage scope and budget as part of the delivery. Yeah, and I understand those decisions were made whilst there were no councillors here. Um, but at the end of the day, the community miss out. So I just want that flagged that there were three effectively community spaces now into one and it's, and it's effectively a lot smaller than what the community were consulted about. Thank you. Can I, sorry, can I, can I, Chair, just one other, just out of, just out of context. Um, so the 500 square metre function room for a, for a general community space is a very large function room. This space we are in here is about 588 square metres. So it, that was, again, part of the rationale around revising and refining that scope. But just wanted to share that. I respect, I respect that, Nigel, but I'm referring to what the community were consulted about. Thank you, Councillor Bradley, and that's noted. Any further questions? There being no further questions, uh, the motion is on the board ahead of you. Can I have someone to move the motion? Thank you, Councillor Bannon. Can I have someone to second the motion? Councillor Raven, all those in favour, please raise your hand. That's all with the exception of Councillor Bradley. Councillor Bradley is abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Councillor Bradley. Uh, that makes the end of the Sport, Leisure and Facility Manager's report. Are there any um, items of general business for the manager? Nigel, do you have any items for us? Awesome. Thank you, Nigel. I appreciate your report. Councillors, it was remiss of me to have actually overlooked the hard work of um, the advocacy program leader, Bridget Rogan, earlier today, and I just wanted to acknowledge her in this forum for putting together the 2020-2021 uh, COVID Works for Queensland funding program um, report, um, which I know you've all read, and I just publicly wanted to thank her for her hard work in relation to all of that. Just before we close, I note that due to social distancing restrictions, not all managers or staff can attend today. That being said, does anyone have any general business for the Director of Innovation and, uh, sorry, for the Director of Communication, sorry, Community Services, <laughs> my apologies. Has anyone got any GB for Katie? Me. <laughs> Thank you, um, Councillor Wilcox. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping I'm, a, I'm addressing this to the right person through the chair. Um, the crank program, the holiday program, I think has done an outstanding job of going online. I th for me, I think it's actually exceeded expectations um, and that sort of thing. I know I personally tried to book my own children in on, on June 1st that night into about five different things and they were all sold out and my kids were 
devastated um, and that sort of thing. But I wanted to find out because people in the community have been asking me, is there any way that we can get more packs for, you've actually got 12 that are completely sold out. Is there any way that we can get more packs organised for these school holidays for some of these kids and that sort of thing? Through the chair, I'd be happy to take any um, suggestions on further budget to the community services mm. branch. Mm. <laughs> well played, Director. Well played. <laughs> Specific to your question, we can look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for the Director? There being no further questions, I declare the meeting closed at 12.33. Thank you for your attendance, councillors.